our next speaker, Ivan Kobayashi, is going to continue on this theme of uh, rare diseases. And the disease that she works on, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, is sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum of the story you just heard, uh, in that uh, there are a lot of, of patients worldwide who have been identified, their mutations have been sequenced, there are drugs and clinical trials that are doing good for some of these patients, there are parent organizations that have uh, gotten together to help these kids, and, and so it's a uh, sort of what can happen if something like the NGLI1 story matures uh, a little bit more. Avon is a, uh, a scientist at, at Eli Lilly, and, and like everyone else in this session, I started Googling to see what I could learn about her. And I even wrote her an email and said, uh, hi, I'm going to introduce you. Is there anything I can say about you? And she said, hey, I met you uh, in Iowa. Don't you remember me? Uh, you gave a talk out there. And so now I have to tell you the truth. So I, I'm sure I had a wonderful visit in Iowa. But when I was in the airport in Des Moines, I had the, an accident. All right, I happened to sit next to Miss Iowa uh, in the Des Moines airport, and I noticed that she was studying for the Miss USA contest. And we ended up spending three hours talking about things like, what's your favorite color? And stuff like that. And so, so that's my only memory of Iowa. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> And if, if, uh, if Glenn Treisman or some other psychiatrist is here, perhaps you can help me with this deficit. I'm sure it's curable, but uh, uh, Yvonne, we we'll look forward to this. Thank you. So thank you. Um, I guess you couldn't find anything on Google about me. <laughs> Um, so, as a disclaimer, um, the work that I'm going to present here is from my previous work at the University of Iowa. So, currently I am employed by Eli Lilly and Company. Um, so, Larry kind of gave the title of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a not so rare disease, and I'm kind of putting in my title of dystrophinopathies beyond a scalable muscle disease. Um, the reason why is because um, when I did my work at University of Iowa, I had this unique opportunity to work at this Iowa Muscular Dystrophy Center, which was part of the MD, um, the Muscular Dystrophy Care Act that was um, started in 2001, and where they wanted to start a center of excellence for educating clinicians as well as researchers and just providing great opportunities for research in muscular dystrophies. And um, another great thing about this is that I got to have a lot of translational research experience and talking with clinicians. We talked about um, undiagnosed muscular dystrophies, so it was just a great opportunity to really dive into different muscular dystrophies, and even undiagnosed ones, because we came across a lot of muscular dystrophies and we were trying to figure out what to do in these conferences. So um, it's been an incredible few years for muscular dystrophy. Um, so in 2013, in September, um, Lilly announced that they were going to do a clinical trial, a phase three clinical trial um, using Tadalafil uh, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD. And you might say, Tadalafil, this is also known as Cialis. Uh, that's not exactly a muscle drug. So, uh, so that's a little unusual. And uh, uh, one key uh, interesting point is that if you look at the enrollment, 306 patients. That's pretty large for a rare disease. So you might want to say, is this really a rare disease if we can get 306 patients? In fact, a lot of people came up to me and said, why did you choose so many patients for this trial if it's so rare? You're, you're going to kill yourself trying to get enrollment. But actually, uh, this year, we got full enrollment. And actually, we got more than full enrollment. So again, it might say, how did we do that if it's a rare disease? But, and we also got this, um, as of two weeks ago, we got Tadalafil designated as an orphan drug. So this is pretty significant. So evidently, it is an orphan disease. But how we got to do this was through this MD, MDA CARE Act. Now, 2014, last year, we got an amendment um, that was signed, and it, it just added on to the already existing act 
that allowed us to have this increased awareness and in education and designing these centers of excellence, uh, increased funding, and the key thing is strength happens together. Strength happens in numbers. And just like in Matt's case, you know, you have parents getting involved, patient advocacy groups. This is really important. And the only way that we were able to get all these patients so quickly was there's these patient registries. And, and people know about all the patients, what trials are going for, because there are a number of trials. And you have to consider for rare diseases, and there's a lot of people testing different therapies, it's going to chip away at your population, your, your patient population. So who's going to be in your trial? Even though if it's a rare disease, you still have to have a powered number of patients in your trial to make it significant for FDA, even though they do allow you a lower number because of a rare disease. But still, this is very significant and what you can do as, uh, by combining your numbers and your strength. So, now to go into what I did. So first of all, for those of you who don't know what muscular dystrophy is, it is a very heterogeneous group of genetic diseases. And it has a very, very complex pathogenesis. And um, where it leads to progressive muscle weakness and degeneration of skeletal muscle. So there, there is no cure so far for any muscular dystrophy. So there is an, a high unmet medical need. So even though that we have like more than 600 muscles in our body, it's amazing that these are genetic diseases and not all the muscles are equally affected. So there's research that is going on about trying to find out why some muscles are preserved and others are affected. So, but in the clinic, physicians go and use the areas of muscles that are affected to classify these muscular dystrophies. Now right now I have six up here. This was taken from a publication in 1998, but there's actually nine classifications of muscular dystrophies. And the one that I worked on was on the far left, Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. So this is a gene table that is put out every year about new genes that have been identified for muscular dystrophies. So Matt, yours is probably gonna be on this list. Um, I updated this um, probably last year. And up until then, there, I think there were about 50 genes identified for specific muscular dystrophies. When I started my research in muscular dystrophy, there was maybe only 30. And between when I updated this last year in February and I think just recently, 44 new genes were identified. And this is because of all the new sequencing technology and the exome sequencing. It's pretty amazing. But from this list, about 25% of the genes identified right here are involved in stabilizing the muscle cell membrane and keeping it repaired. So the cell membrane around the muscle cell is a sarcolemma. And um, what we know now from years and years of research is that this, there's a link that's really critical for stabilizing the muscle cell membrane, starting from the basal lamina at the top, going down to the cytoskeleton. And this helps hold the muscle membrane together for each contraction. And whenever there is, say, like um, a damage to the muscle membrane, the protein on the right, dysferlin, helps repair the damage. Now, you can see the importance of all these proteins because whenever there's a mutation in any one of them, it leads to some form of muscular dystrophy or some pathology. So what a normal muscle looks like for, I, I talked to a pathologist earlier today, <laughs> um, is that if you stain it uh, with some dyes and look under the microscope, you'll see a normal pallor pretty uniform pallor of the muscle. You see uniform muscle fiber size, and you'll see the periphery that there's nuclei. But you'll see telltale signs of muscular dystrophy um, in the biopsies of patients. You see in between the spaces uh, of the muscle fibers, it's increased space, and that's endomesial fibrosis. You see, you see the different colors, the different pallor, the different sizes of the muscle fibers, and you'll see central nucleation. You see fatty infiltration and some inflammation. So these are all signs of multiple, multiple rounds of degeneration of the muscle fiber and regeneration. So um, I like going into history a lot. And I was telling somebody earlier that I like a lot of hair and beards on guys. And these, <laughs> so <laughs> I like mutton chops. But I really like the history of muscular dystrophy because um, it was identified in the mid-1850s. And uh, so this is when mutton chops were really big. <laughs> and, um, but it was identified by Dr. Uh, Edward Marion and Guillaume Duchenne. So these are clinicians and just very observant. Oh, sorry. 
And um, they were just very observant guys. But if you notice that the name of the disease is called Duchenne. So the reason why is because Dr. Duchenne was, he was very observant, he was very outspoken, and he published prolifically, whereas the other guy didn't. So <laughs> this tells you something. Um, but one thing that, um, and the, uh, Dr. Duchenne was also a little, little different so, um, in his observations. So this picture, I, I really like this picture because it's a picture of Hercules, but um, back then in the 1800s, Guillaume Duchenne, he noticed this picture, and even though this is Hercules epitomizing strength, he said, oh, this is a sign of weakness. And people thought, you're crazy. Well, the reason why is because he was also an amateur photographer. So he started taking pictures of the patients that he would identify in the Parisian hospitals that he was kind of skulking around looking for new diseases. And so he noticed that there was always these families of boys. They had muscle atrophy. But one thing strange, they had these very hypertrophic calves. And when he examined them, he noticed they were very weak. So that's why he said Hercules, the symbol of Hercules, is actually a sign of weakness. But the one thing that Duchenne and Marion agreed upon was that in 1836, they said the pathogenesis was due to a breakdown of the sarcolemma due to a deficit in muscle nutrition from the blood. Now remember, they didn't know the gene. They didn't, you know, the, the limited, there was no internet or anything like that. So um, this was just purely based on observation. Now, let's jump 151 years ahead. Um, 1987, uh, Luke Hunkel's lab identified the gene. The, this is the largest gene known. And he did this, this is the first human disease-related gene identified by positional cloning. And I remember when this happened, it was pr pretty amazing. And that same year, Kevin Campbell also identified the protein structure. Now he's my former advisor, so um, it, I remember when all this protein was happening, I remember that everyone's talking about gene therapy. So this was a monumental change in everyone's thinking. They said, gene therapy, the, you know, the cure is just around the corner. And we all know that that doesn't happen like that. So going back to, to um, Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. So um, the DMD gene is X-linked. And you know, it, the dystrophin is the long black protein on the cytoskeleton. And so when that's missing, that's Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this disrupts that link that I was talking about and it makes the membrane unstable. So it, since it's on the X chromosome, it, uh, this, the incidence of the disease is one in 3,500 male births. And it starts out with proximal muscle weakness as early as two to six years of age. So parents realize that maybe their kid's a little weak and so they bring him into the doctor or the neurologist and then they take a blood sample and they find out that they actually have elevated serum creatine kinase levels, which is indicative of some necrosis and muscle damage, but it shouldn't be that high at a child, um, young child. So then we see this pseudohypertrophy, that's a telltale sign that Duchenne and Marion saw. And if looking at a biopsy of the, um, the calf muscle, you'll see that the telltale signs of multiple rounds of degeneration and regeneration. But eventually, this pseudohypertrophy goes away because the degeneration process takes over the, the regeneration process. And without the muscle supporting the spine, the patient gets scoliosis. I don't know if you can see it down there, respiratory problems and cardiomyopathy, which is usually what causes death for these patients because they can't breathe and, their heart, and they have heart problems. Now, Becker muscular dystrophy is a milder form because they actually express dystrophin, but it's either at a lesser amount or at a truncated form. So the clinical path for these patients is pretty steady, I would say. Um, they get this waddling gait due to weakness in their thighs or in, in their um, gluteal <coughs> muscles. They'll have scapular winging, um, they'll have lower doses, lumbar lower doses, and they'll have the pseudohypertrophy. They'll start toe walking because of contractures in their ankles. And then they'll have this other sign called the Gower's maneuver or Gower sign, where they, um, the doctor will ask them to lie, lie down supine on the floor and ask them to get up. They can't just sit up. They have to roll over and actually walk up their legs because of the weakness in their thighs. And if you notice that this picture is actually uh, drawn from Dr. Gowers himself in 1879. So you can see that nothing much has changed in all these years. And they get a progressive loss of mobility for these patients. And um, if they're not on uh, glucocorticoid stero uh, steroids, they're usually wheelchair-bound as early as 12 years of age. 
So even though the clinical path has not changed, the actual natural history has changed quite a bit over the years. So if you look 1800s to 1970, this was purely a pediatric disease. And you can see that basically they started losing ambulation very early and they, the loss of self-feeding. So they, they were basically um, in severe care right away. But in 1970, 1980s, spinal surgery and diagnosis came about. And uh, you, you can see we moved their loss of ambulation later, loss of self-feeding, and we actually doubled their lifespan. But you notice most of their adult lifespan is held basically in wheelchairs. So they're, they're under managed care. And current therapies now, because of um, genetic counseling and testing, they can actually diagnose very early. And um, the loss of ambulation is a little bit later, but still we haven't doubled, I mean, we haven't improved on the lifespan. So we want to try to look at therapies that will help improve their quality of life um, and even extend it even further. So right now, um, the clinical endpoints that are in clinical trials focus on for at least ambulation, uh, ages 7 through 14, because that's when they have their most severe decline in ambulation. For those who are, have lost ambulation, they try to do like upper limb strength, because you have to show some form of improvement in function, muscle function. So to maintain mobility, that's a key aspect of uh, what the FDA wants to see. But for just the patient himself, they want to look to see, um, to prevent the, comp the, prevent the complications from inactivity. They also want to help maintain the range of motion, because this just helps them keep mobile and loose. And for any muscle disease, this is always good to have just to maintain movement. And it's really good for the quality of life for the patient because it keeps them social, keeps them interactive with their family and friends. So starting out, we have a mutation in the dystrophin gene. It's, it's in the um, genomic defect. And you start getting the degeneration. But you also get regeneration and repair. So this helps maintain the patient for a little bit. That's where they're kind of growing, and then when they start hitting age 7 to 14, you start seeing a decline because eventually the body just can't keep up with this regeneration and repair. And you start getting other factors coming in, coming from all different time points. So there's nothing synchronous about this. And this was eventually leads to necrosis and fibrosis and muscle death. So what a lot of therapies focus on is trying to calm down these later effects and even trying to calm them down enough to give gene therapy a chance. Because sometimes, if you try to insert a gene into this mess, you, it probably won't have much of an effect because it's just too much for the body to handle. So it, it's more likely that you will have to do a combination of therapies to try to get one to work. So this is how I started my therapy, or my, my research, at the University of Iowa. I was trying to look for something that was non-dystrophin-centric. Non I was trying to look for something that would be able to improve exercise, at least after activity, I was, and reduce the edema that usually occurs in these patients after they exercise. And when I say exercise, I mean it's very mild exercise. And then um, also not increase uh, muscle damage as in indexed by um, creatine kinase levels in the serum. So this, I was doing a phenotypic screen in a mouse model. So the mouse model I chose was the MDX mouse. It's not a perfect model, but it is a has a naturally occurring mutation in the dystrophin gene. And it seems to mimic most of the disease, except that it maintains uh, regeneration, so that these mice get hypertrophic, and they maintain that. So it's kind of like an early version of the disease for the patients. So the first assay I wanted to develop was an exercise assay. And the key point I wanted to make here was that I did everything in the dark for this, because these are nocturnal animals. They are most active at night. So I didn't want to do all my exercise assays during the day, because it, it led to a lot of variability, because you're like waking up an animal during their sleep time. The exercise was downhill, very short, 10 minutes, 15 meters per minute. So it was very mild exercise. And then to look at the activity, I use this open field assay system, very easy. Um, it's specifically for rodents, and it has an XYZ um, infrared beams that monitors all their activity. So when you place the rodent in there, they actually, you can measure everything. So I chose vertical activity to kind of do my screen. I wanted to do a quick screen. This is kind of the readout you're going to see. So if you look on the left panel of this chart, you see pre-exercise, all these little dots are just 
incidence of movement. And after exercise, you see there's a clear difference in post-exercise. So I think I'm going to try this video here. So this is the wild-type animal. Whoops. Did it work? Before and after exercise. So you really can't tell a difference between them. But this is the MDX mouse before and after exercise. So clearly, there's something happening after exercise. So you can quantitate this. If you look at the blue bars, pre-exercise, you can't tell a difference in the vertical activity. White bars, after exercise. In the MDX mouse, clearly, boom, loss in activity. Something's happening there. On the right side is actually looking at muscle strength, specific muscle strength in the EDL muscle in the leg. You see, there is a significant drop, but it's not a huge drop, even though it is significant. It doesn't explain why pre-exercise, there's no difference in their activity. And it doesn't explain post-exercise what's happening. So this gave me the first indication that there's something beyond the skeletal muscle that's occurring. Um, in that uh, open field activity assay, I also wanted to mimic something in clinical trials like the six-minute walk test. So this is an image from Craig McDonald's paper where he, he does a six-minute walk test for multiple diseases. And here he looked at normal and DMD boys. And you can see that the, in turquoise is the DMD boys. And there, there's not much of a window, but they do have lower mobility. And if you monitor individual patients, you may be able to track efficacy of a drug. But it's not a perfect assay for um, patients but it's what the FDA approves right now, and you have to have other measures to kind of compensate for its deficiencies. So in the mouse, this is pre-exercise. You see the wild type on the top and MDX in red. So I saw a small window without exercise. With exercise, I saw a greater window, so I knew I had a nice window for my assay. I also wanted to look at muscle edema, so I incorporated MRI analysis and I'm not an MRI expert, but I was able to <laughs> kind of adapt to it. Um, I really like it because you're able to look at multiple areas in a live mouse and, and track the pathology of the disease very nicely. Um, another thing I wanted to do was, at the time when I started this, it was around 2004, 2005, um, the microdystrophin gene therapy was entering phase one of clinical trials. So microdystrophin is a truncated version of the dystrophin protein. So you see the top one's the full length. MDX doesn't have dystrophin. Microdystrophin, um, Jeff Chamberlain's lab did an experiment in where they tried to find the smallest portion of dystrophin that can go into um, the mouse and basically rescue the pathology. And the data on the bottom shows that um, Two, two contractions showing the percent force deficit basically brought it back to wild-type levels, this microdystrophin. And when you run these mice on a treadmill, they actually ran double than what the wild-type did. So this, like, this is a great rescue mouse, and I'm, I was glad that it was in clinical trials. And I thought it would be a great first mouse to use in my assay. So another mutton chops guy. <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, I had a, one of those, it's not a eureka moment, I had a that's funny mo moment because when I put this mouse in my assay, instead of showing like complete wild type phenotype or profile, it showed basically the MDX profile. So something was weird here. I was like, that's funny. And I checked it in MRI. Well, it didn't have the post-exercise edema, so something's weird about this. Then you just have to connect the dots and go back. Um, Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy it's a truncated form of the dystrophin gene, so it's missing parts of the middle. And then in 2002, Dr. Louise Anderson, she wrote this paper where she tracked all the mutations in Becker muscular dystrophy, and they all seemed to track to one spot on dystrophin. But at the time, we didn't know what it meant. And you can see the, the dates here, 2009, 2013, it was identified that it was an NNOS binding domain on dystrophin, but I didn't know it then. <laughs> and, um, the figure, the immunofluorescence image on the right, shows that in Becker patients that they actually uh, don't have NNOS staining if you try to stain for, on their uh, biopsies. Uh, so this was actually used as a diagnostic tool for a while. And one thing important is that these patients show profound fatigue after a little bit of exercise. So it was kind of exactly what I saw with the mice. So I went back to these microdystrophin mice and I probed for NNOS and I didn't see it. And if you look at the I don't know if you can see very well, but the tissue looks a little smaller than the wild-type tissue, so it's not exactly a perfect rescue. So something was going on there. And when I did a biochemical preparation of the muscle, 
NNOS is expressed. It's just not at the membrane. So I took a wild type mouse and I injected some a specific NNOS inhibitor. And I got a similar profile, this exercise activity assay. So it showed me that this was NNOS specific. And when I tried to do this six minute walk test, I even brought it all the way out to 30 minutes. And it was showing a similar profile to MDX mice. So then I just like, okay, let's look at some knockout mice. So um, endothelial nitric oxide synthase is really important for um, blood flow in, in arteries. So I wanted to look at ENOS knockout mice and NNOS knockout mice. And you can just see from the profile that the, only the NNOS knockout mice had that profile that I was seeing in all the muscular dystrophy mice. So since nitric oxide is so important for vascular flow, what I did was I injected microfill, and this forms a three-dimensional cast of the vasculature that's, that's perfusible. So if you look on the left, top left, that's the wild-type tissue. Um, you can see the tapering of the vessels. It's very nice perfusion of the nearby tissue. You see the MDX, MDX on the right. It looks like, hmm, not so pretty. There's some vascular uh, contractions, and there's not much perfusion in the nearby tissue. Same thing with the NNOS tissue. So what was going on here? I wasn't sure if this was vasoconstriction or just low vessel density due to the pathology. So then I crossed these MDX mice with a TIE 2 lac z mouse. So this enables you to stain all the vessels, whether perfusible or not. And what I found was, if you look on the right, the MDX quadriceps as well as the diaphragm actually showed more vasculature. So this contradicted my microfill data, but what this told me was that the vessels that are there aren't perfusing. So just to make sure that this was not just a rodent thing, I took the biopsies from the repository um, at the University of Iowa, and I checked Becker muscular dystrophy patients, and I actually counted their uh, vessel to fiber ratio. And in Becker muscular dystrophy patients, I did see an increase in the vessel to fiber ratio as well as uh, DMD patients as they got older. So this seemed like a pretty real um, finding. So what this suggested what the, the, was there, that there was inefficient um, contraction-induced muscle NNOS signaling to local blood vessels. And this brings about um, the hypothesis of a two-hit hypothesis. So the first hit is the loss of dystrophin. If you see it in the normal tissue, you see that there is a stable membrane and there's nitric oxide near the membrane so that when there's a contraction, nitric oxide gets released and quickly diffuses to the local blood supply so that there's vasodilation. But in the muscular dystrophy case, there's dystrophin that's gone, so that's the first hit. And the second hit is that, well, nitric oxide is not where it should be. So when, you, when there's contraction, you're not getting the blood supply that you need to the contracting muscle, so now it's causing ischemia. Second hit. Too much for the muscle to take care of when, when there's so much going on. So this brings about um, what's also called functional sympatholysis. So usually, uh, your brain keeps all your vessels in this tone so that you're not like opening all your blood vessels and you just get, you fall from <laughs> low blood pressure. So, but when you exercise, you're also increasing sympathetic nerve signals to your vasculature. And the only way to lyse this signal is from local metabolites that come from the muscle itself, that being like nitric oxide synthase. So that counteracts or lyses the sympathetic signal, and now you have functional sympatholysis. Um, the guy who actually pioneered this work um, is Ron Victor, and when he was at UT Southwest, and I'm not an expert in this, but I can tell you that um, what you see to the right is when you see this change in this femoral vascular conductance, this is that functional sympatholysis. And what he found back in the uh, late 1990s was that the MDX mouse as well as NNOS mice are actually lacking this functional sympatholysis. He didn't know the significance of it at the time, but it was pretty significant that there's something going on in the vasculature. And then he also, the following two years, he showed this in the DMD patients, that they were also missing this functional sympatholysis. So it seems like the mice is recapitulating what we're, we're seeing in the patients. So back to my screen. So while all this was going on, I was screening a ton of compounds. I had no idea what I was doing. And, um, but then when it started leaning towards vasodilation, I'm just showing you a panel of drugs that I screened just for vasodilation. And um, you can see that all the vasodilators that I screened, you see on the y-axis, percent vertical activity loss. So that actually caused them to lose more activity because they became 
Um, they had low blood pressure, basically, when I gave them the vasodilator. So it's too much vasodilation. The only ones that worked were sildenafil and tadalafil, basically Viagra and Cialis. So I went back and I tested it in my system. I don't know if you can see that. Um, I did the MRI to see if you can uh, get rid of the muscle edema, and I saw when you treat it with tadalafil or sildenafil, post-exercise, there's no muscle edema. And uh, 2013, um, a group down in Florida who are experts in MRI, they did the same thing with sildenafil, a little more intricate, um, but they saw the same thing with sildenafil, except they ran their mice for 30 to 60 minutes, which to me I think is too exhaustion, because I only did a 10-minute run, and I, I got great results from that. So back to my uh, exercise activity assay. When I treated the mice and just looked at their basal activity, uh, the PD-5 inhibitors actually had an effect on their basal activity. And then for the post-exercise activity, they actually improved it by 50%. So this was pretty significant, considering this is a non-dystrophin um, type of therapy I was looking at. Then for blood perfusion, I did laser Doppler imaging and uh, I saw that before and after exercise in the wild-type mice, there was increased perfusion of the tissues, whereas in the MDX mice, you can see there was clearly not as much. And when I added a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, clearly there was increased blood flow, which explained um, all the other data that I was getting. And then when I did the microfill analysis, now I'm seeing all the little blood vessels opening up. It's, not, it's still not pretty, but because it's still, it's not a perfect system. It's, you know, dystrophin is still gone but clearly the muscle is getting better perfused, and so probably ischemia, ischemia is being prevented. And then this increased their run times, their run distance, but more importantly, it did not increase their muscle damage, not as much as without the drug. And that's what we want. We don't want to increase muscle damage in these patients. So um, at the time, not a lot of people believed me <laughs> when I was doing this, um, but uh, a group at Harvard was doing something. They were just looking for ischemia. And since I was doing a phenotypic screen, um, you know, no one quite believed me. But when this, this group did it, they did it a little different. They injected the mice um, with Evans blue dye. And they, but they also treated the mice for seven weeks, starting in utero. So Evans blue dye binds to albumin. If there's a break in the muscle cell membrane, the dye moves into your muscles. So it'll stain blue if you have muscle damage. So you can tell, very blue muscle, very blue diaphragm. But when they treated uh, the mice with Tadalafil from um, E0.5 to 4 weeks, clearly muscle damage was prevented. And when they did histology, you can see clearly there's a difference in the pathology of the muscle. Another group also in Florida, um, University of Miami, they used sildenafil. Uh, you can tell it's not as good as tadalafil. And I'm not saying that because I like Lily and stuff. But um, you can see that there is a reduction in the blue dye uptake. There's less fibrosis, and what they saw was there was actually an increase in muscle force in the diaphragm. It's not much, but a little bit can go a long way. And then Lou Kunkel's group actually repeated my data just recently in 2014, and they used sildenafil. They saw basically the same things, increased run distance, increased ambulation, uh, vertical activity, and decrease in muscle damage. So it's really great when other people can repeat your data years on end. So it seems to validate um, what you initially did, even though no one believed you at the time. <laughs> um, back to the microdystrophin mice. Um, this group in North Carolina, they went back and compared the microdystrophin mice, and they actually made another microdystrophin where they put the NNOS binding domain. And they saw that when the NNOS binding domain was added, they got return of functional sympatholysis. If you look at the turquoise line, they also improved mobility ever, over an eight-day period whereas the microdystrophin, which I was originally testing, you saw a decline in the activity over eight days. Uh, Lee Sweeney at UPenn, he also is testing Tadalafil in the golden retriever model of muscular dystrophy. And what he found after 18 months of treating, um, he saw that the left ventricular um, fractional shortening was improved in these dogs. So they mimic the human disease very well. And then when he did muscle analysis, he saw that in the EDL and diaphragm, there was clearly less muscle damage and fibrosis. I mean, it's, it's still not perfect, but there was clearly less. And they also improved mobility. Now, zebrafish, another model. Um, Luke Kunkel's group does uh, zebrafish screening of, um, for 
dystrophin negative muscular dystrophies. So one way, is, uh, two ways of looking at uh, a screen is to look at basically the muscle architecture where you can shine a light and look at the birefringence of the muscle fibers. They, they come in registers, so you can see that on the left. And on the right, dystrophin is, you can see the ratcheting of the muscle, so you can see there's uh, muscle pathology. And another way is to actually looking at muscle function. And bear with me, I hope this works. So um, zebrafish, you can just actually tap them on the tail, and they'll swim away. So that's their motion. But this is a nebulin-deficient zebrafish that also has a muscular dystrophy. So clearly, they don't move very well. I think it, I think it moved. <laughs> so. He went with the birefringence because you can do a little higher throughput screening with this. And um, he screened this Prestwick library, which is 1,200 um, FDA-approved drugs. And what came out of this, what improved birefringence, so this is a non-dystrophant phenotypic screen again, he found seven compounds. And what's interesting, again, he did a phenotypic screen like me, but it was totally different, different model. And he found this nonspecific phosphodiesterase inhibitor. What do you know? <laughs> so he lo looked at survival. This is wild type and the dystrophin negative uh, zebrafish. And when he tested this PD4 or PD inhibitor, it is the one that improved their survival the best. The other ones, eh, they didn't do so great. Sometimes crashed their survival. But when they looked at the muscle biopsies for, if you want to call them biopsies from these zebrafish, it actually repaired their muscle. This is non dystrophin. And then when they compared it to other phosphodiesterase inhibitors, the closest one it matched was sildenafil. So a completely different assay kind of agreed with other people's data and my data. So now to translate this. So Ron Victor and I, we, we got together and was like, well, how can we kind of translate this into the humans? So um, because these are muscular dystrophy patients, you can't make them run or anything like that. So he, had, he designed this assay where he's going to do a grip meter strength and, and then use this lower body negative pressure for the sympathetic activation. Bottom line is he saw that sildenafil and tadalafil had an effect on the hyperemic response, and it brought back this the functional sympatholysis. So this was the, one of the first translatable endpoints, MDX, to patients with DMD and Becker muscular dystrophy. So, this is to conclude that from, from my work, we, all, we saw improvement in ambulation, and from other people's work, just different labs, independent labs, different models, we all came to the same conclusion, so, and different methodologies, which is really great, and we hope that this can lead to a potential therapy or some mechanism that we can aim at therapy, but can, do you believe it or not? I mean, but now you go back to history. Now you can connect the dots. If you go back to earlier evidence, they actually thought this was a vascular disease originally. Um, there was clear evidence that these patients had poor circulation. They, um, they were mottled, bluish skin. Um, there was evidence from uh, Jerry Mandel's lab. He did a model where he did, had ischemia in the animal model, and it looked like muscular dystrophy. This was in 1971. 1974, abnormal capillaries were identified in the patients, biopsies. And then these electron micrographs from, I think they were from 1979, 1974. Um, they also showed there were possible vascular defects. And again, this is before the gene was identified. Why didn't they pursue any more? Well, because the gene was identified. It switched everything to gene therapy. So this kind of got lost in the science for a while. Um, but now it's coming back, and so now we, you know, we're in this clinical trial. So to summarize, Duchenne, after 179 years since the gene was first identified, 28 years since the mutation was identified, still no cure, still high unmet medical need. But let's not think of a negative. This is actually a positive, ever-increasing understanding of the patient and the disease. This is really important because, so like what, what Larry's doing with the biomarkers. This is really important because we really need endpoint measures. There are no endpoints or biomarkers for these diseases, so it's really important that we try to identify and validate new ones. And we need to have new ideas, and these biomarkers can also give us new ideas for targets. And this will help us also probably plan for faster screens when we look for drugs. 
we're finding out more about the natural history and about the animal models. So as a precautionary note, when you go into animal models, Matt, um, once you go into them, you have to make sure that they're uniform the way people analyze them, or else you'll get lost in all this data. So the one thing that um, the engagement with the FDA and Duchenne community, we got, we got together, we formed standard operating procedures to make sure now that all analysis is very uniform so that you don't have to question the data or how the lab did it. And then that, we also have another lab repeat the data so that we can see that you know, this is real data and we can move forward with the best possible drug. But this all is part of the engagement of the MDA, the MD Care Act and all the patient advocacy groups and interaction with the parents and the patients. So this is, it's been really remarkable and I hope that, you know, Matt, you get to the, that stage with this. So in con just my acknowledgments, I want to really thank the families and the patients, uh, the Parent Project for Muscular Dystrophy, the Muscular Dystrophy Foundation, the DMD research community, and of course all the grants that I had when I was faculty at the University of Iowa. And I hope to do more in this field later on and I'll take any questions. Ed? Um, did you repeat these experiments on any of the triple mutants, MDX plus other mutants that are more like you shot muscular No, I did not do that. I did try uh, the MDX eutrophin double mutant, and the, but those, they just don't move. And they're, they're just too bad. Emily? <laughs> So now that you've identified ischemia as one of the major problems uh, in muscular dystrophy, have you explored other common ther therapies that have in other settings that are used as like anticoagulation therapy or statins? Uh, for muscular dystrophy? So um, what I do know is that uh, this ischemia can happen in multiple muscular dystrophies. Um, I don't know what standard of care that other patients are on. Uh, I haven't tried combination of therapies. But uh, I know that at least the clinical trial, they have to be on their standard of care of glucocorticoids. So I'm not sure um, like what statins will do with it. Uh, firstly, for any rare disease, that's really uh, impressive and inspirational. So thank you. And uh, do you know what part of the budget the MD Care Act came from, if that was part of DOD or NIH? It's NIH. NIH. Large part of it's NIH. In the back, just yell. Um, a comment and two questions. One, uh, listening to the pathogenesis of the degeneration, regeneration of muscle cycle, it struck me as resembling a kind of like cirrhosis of the muscle. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know whether anybody's thought of it that way, so that's a comment. Um, a question. The cardiomyopathy that develops, same pathogenetic mechanism, the Strophin problem in, in cardiomyocytes, yes? Uh, yes, but there seems to be compensation uh, in the cardiac muscle. So it, it happens much later, usually uh, very late in the pathogenesis. Second question. Um, the profound uh, post-exercise fatigue mm -hmm. in, in some of the muscular dystrophies sounds extremely similar to one of the major diagnostic criteria for so-called chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. Any work going in that direction? Uh, before I left the University of Iowa, I was actually trying to go into that research, but uh, I stopped. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I've got uh, two questions. One is, um, with patients, you know, reading about the results of this and so forth, are there issues uh, with them just getting uh, Viagra or uh, medications for their kids? And then the second thing is, is it, and just having them take it to, because it might help, and then the second question is uh, the steroid therapies that are so standard for kids. Is there any evidence that those may improve perfusion maybe in a secondary manner. And uh, I can tell you, okay, for the first one, yes, there is a possibility that the, the kids or the families will get just the, their own drugs. But uh, I believe the doses will be too high and it might lead to adverse events. Um, I have seen some blogs 
but um, it, it, they get headaches or flushing. It's, I think the doses are too high for them. And second, um, do, do any of them stay better longer than four hours? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and the second question was whether steroids may be acting in part by improving perfusion to muscles. So um, I tested the steroids in um, the MDX mice, and actually it made their edema much worse, and their mobility stayed the same. So I think it just keeps them at a certain level. I'm not sure if it's actually working at the increasing blood flow level. Um, Yvonne, really enjoyed your presentation. Um, switching gears to metabolic indications, there are a number of genetic disorders in metabolism where you have significantly reduced sympathetic output. To what extent could that be predicted to lead to muscle ischemia if in those disorders significant exercise regimens are engaged? Um. Well, exercise does actually help, so it, it kind of goes along with a hyperemic response. And I believe there's some nitric oxide contribution in these metabolic disorders. Am I correct? <laughs> well, we can discuss the specific ones, okay. but um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the research that would look at perfusion in muscle under those conditions. Um, yeah, we can talk later on that. So, uh, over here. Hi. <laughs> So that was fantastic. So um, some of your talk uh, brings up some of the sensitivities around the issues that Matt brought up with regard to trial of therapies uh, by parents or families before you have the clinical trials completed. And there's a tension that exists between waiting for those, that information and uh, watching the natural history progress, right? And then factor in that uh, payers uh, sometimes get into the mix and can play a uh, confounding role in all that by guiding formulary and restricting off-label use. Can pharma play a role through social networks in terms of facilitating some of this patient-driven research that we're talking about if exercise tolerance is improved? Is there an opportunity to measure that even now, if any off-label use is per being performed, rather than just allowing physicians to be physicians, as we like to allow them to be, uh, and maybe not capturing some of that data along the way? So pharma has a strict rule. We can't promote the off-label use, so we can't really make use of any information from that, unfortunately. But there is information out on blogs, I know there is. 